You stand on the shore of the ocean watching the tide come in. You sense the call of the sea beckoning to take you in further. You step forward little by little not knowing what to expect, but expecting more. You keep going as the ocean calls, calls you to enter in to deeper waters. Hello everyone and welcome to the Deeper Waters Podcast. Right, we have got a great show here set up for you and this is one that's been in the work for a while and we've only got one guest right now but we're hoping to have two of us join us. I'm not sure how this is going to work out entirely. Yes, we're going to have people from two of our continents on here today but we're going to be discussing a very important book. It's one called How God Became Jesus, a response to Bart Ehrman's How Jesus Became God. Now, let me tell you about the other guests that I'm going to have coming on later on. One of them is going to be Michael Bird. And Michael Bird is a lecturer in theology at Ridley, Melbourne, origin of college, Ridley, Melbourne College of Mission and Ministry in Melbourne, Australia. He is the author of Jesus and the Origins of a Gentile Mission, The Saving Righteousness of God, Studies on Power, Justification, and a New Perspective, Evangelical Theology, Bourgeois Babes, Bossy Wives, and Bobby Haircuts. A moderate case for gender equality in ministry, and, and he's the editor of the Apostle Paul Four Views. He is also a co blogger of the New Testament blog Evangelion. Chris, Dr. Chris Tierney will be joining us later on. He's a lecturer in New Testament studies at St. Melitus College and visiting lecturer in theology at King's College, London. He is the author of Paul's Divine Christology and the editor of Beyond Old and New Perspectives on Paul. He also runs the Biblical Studies blog Christendom. And my current guest is Dr. Charles Hill, who, if you remember incorrectly, was here last week. And he joined the Reformed Theological Seminary in Orlando staff in 1994, where he's a professor of New Testament. He teaches on Hebrews, Revelation, and New Testament Greek, and he received his Ph.D. from Cambridge University. And he has significant research interest in the Johannin Kemp Corpus, New Testament books associated with the Apostle John, and he has researched and written extensively on several issues related to the early church fathers, particularly early Christian views of the end times, the canon of the New Testament, and the tradition of New Testament manuscripts. His most recent publications include Who Chose the Gospels, Probing the Great Gospel Conspiracy, and the Early Text of the New Testament, edited with RTS Professor Michael J. Kruger, both of which we discussed last week. Now, we're going to try and get the other guests, Dr. Turing and Dr. Bird, on here later on whenever they're ready. Uh, the time zone's making it difficult for Dr. Bird in Australia, and Dr. Turing is actually at a wedding in Germany right now. Not his own, though, but he's going to be taking some time in the side room later on to join us. For now, we've got Dr. Hero here with us. So, uh, Dr. Hero, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Welcome back to the show. Uh, can you uh, remind my audience uh, real briefly a little bit about your story here? Okay, well, I was uh, born in uh, Nebraska, raised in Nebraska, and uh, uh, attended church uh, from my youth, and um, then went to university at uh, the University of Nebraska, um, was involved with uh, campus groups there, uh, went to seminary at Westminster Seminary in California, uh, then did a Ph.D. at, at the University of Cambridge, Cambridge as you mentioned. Uh, taught at Northwestern College in Iowa. And since 1994, I've been at uh, Reformed Theological Seminary in, in uh, Orlando. Uh, that's, uh, that's a quick rundown, and uh, uh, I'm open for any other questions. Great. Now, we're here to talk about this book, how God Became Jesus. And you were saying last week that this is certainly an important book. Why does this book matter? Hmm. Well, <clears throat> this book matters because it's, uh, it's an attempt to uh, respond to and, and set the record straight from uh, 
re responding to Bart Ehrman's latest book, uh, How Jesus Became God. Uh, so most of your listeners, I'm sure, will know uh, a little bit about Bart Ehrman's uh, background, reputation, and, and uh, his accomplishments, uh, his many books um, that have uh, sought to problematize and uh, uh, argue against uh, some of the main teachings of Christianity and the, main, and the scriptures upon which uh, Christianity rests. So this last book of his is a book on Christology. I think I just saw someplace where he he has said this is uh, probably probably the most important book that he's written because it has to do with with Jesus Christ Himself and uh, obviously the the basis for faith for for all Christendom. So uh, this is an important book that he's written, and we think it's an important response book. Um, offering a different interpretation of the evidence. Um, as you know, Bart Ehrman is a historian, and he puts forth his, uh, his arguments uh, ostensibly on the basis of historical evidence and uh, comes through with, uh, with a number of arguments, well-reasoned arguments usually. And uh, so his, his work is very uh, popular, He's an outstanding communicator, and uh, has you know has many 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 followers uh, all over the world. His books have been used, I think, very much um, uh, very eagerly by uh, non-believers, atheists, and uh, even Muslims. Uh, I've heard uh, many times about Muslims uh, using Bart Ehrman's books in their attacks against Christianity. So. Uh, we think this is an important book to look at the historical evidence and the biblical evidence for why Christians have always uh, worshipped Jesus as divine and uh, considered him to be, along with the Father and the Holy Spirit, uh, uh, part of the, the one God, the, the Trinity, in the one God in three persons. Now, we should keep in mind with Bart Ehrman also that, in fact, he did something that, as far as I know, no other writer had ever done. That was when he wrote Misquoting Jesus. He got a book on textual criticism, which most Christians would never touch, sadly, to go to the bestseller list and stay there. I mean, that tells us something about the impact that he has, doesn't it? Yes, it certainly does. Uh, I... You know, you you have to hand it to him in in many ways for uh, for being well brave enough to take on a, a subject like that and uh, put it in a readable form. Uh, he really has raised awareness about a lot of issues that have to do with Christianity, and uh, in some ways, you know, I think I think in the long run, after all the dust settles. Uh, we'll see that, that probably a lot of good has come out uh, even of his uh, challenges to Christianity, um, just as, as uh, often happens, um, not through his own intention, but uh, in God's good providence. Uh, a lot of attention has been focused, for instance, upon uh, the text of the New Testament. Uh, it has certainly Bart's Bart's uh, work has certainly caused a lot of uh, a lot of doubt and questioning, uh, but on the other hand, it's also forced a lot of people back uh, to look at the evidence, and has ended, I think, in strengthening the faith of many, and really helping other scholars to get a hearing when we're talking about textual criticism and, and uh, matters related to the canon of the New Testament and so forth. This book is an excellent read. It's one that I think the layman could appreciate, and you'll find when you read it, it is filled with humor. Excellent humor. I'd like to read a section on page 8 and see what you think of this. Not everything Ehrman says about the origins of belief in Jesus' divinity is wrong. <laughs> Some things are quite true. Some things we'd agree with but say differently. Some things we'd suggest need better nuance. And other things we can do are just plain out of sync with the evidence. 
Rabbi Ehrman offers a creative and accessible account of the origins of Jesus' divinity and Christian belief. At the end of the day, we think that his overall case is about as convincing as reports of a mayor of Chicago, Rahm Emanuel, sitting in a Chick-fil-A restaurant, wearing a Texan-style cowboy hat while reading Donald Trump's memoir, which is to say, not convincing at all. But you have to read the rest of the book to find out why. That's right. That's uh, that's uh, classic uh, Michael Byrd humor right there. Yeah, and uh, he has denied, though, that he's the one responsible for the uh, bottle of hand sanitizer that comes with the book when you order it better. At least when you get from Zondervan that says, uh, wash your hands of bad history. <laughs> yeah, he's, uh, he's, he's full, of, uh, full of a lot of jokes. Uh, some of the other authors had to, uh, you might say, tamp down some of the uh, uh, less restrained uh, uh, jokes, but uh, we'll, we'll leave that for uh, some other time to discuss. But yes, uh, uh, Mike has a, a great sense of humor, and I, I think that uh, that does come off uh, in many places in the book, not just in not just in Mike's sections, but uh, we all wanted the book to be readable, obviously, and uh, not be a, uh, a simply an academic tome, one that uh, one that is you know backed by uh, solid research, but one that's very readable to a wide audience. Yes, and I do want to stress to listeners for sure. Please don't think that you can just <clears throat> listen to this podcast alone and get the full worth of everything in this book. By all means, listen to what my guests are saying today, but this is a book you simply must get for yourself. You need to have it on your shelves and be ready. Learn the information that's in there. And, of course, I mean, we'd also say we wouldn't have any trouble with you reading Ehrman's side as well. A good Christian should be informed in reading both sides because, as I've said elsewhere, I'm pretty sure most of our internet atheist crowd and others like that are not going to be reading both sides. Yeah, that's right. And you certainly can learn a lot from uh, reading any of Bart's books. Um, Many times, uh, Bart Ehrman's bark is is worse than his bite. Uh, That is, he's, he's got a penchant for headlines and for stating things in provocative ways, but when you read the fine print, uh, sometimes it's it's not as uh, not as startling as the headlines are. So you can often uh, learn a lot from from what uh, Professor Ehrman says. Uh, this particular book uh, does have a number of his own uh, his own theories uh, about Christology that uh, you won't necessarily find, you know, our uh, our standard views. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, the notion that uh, uh, that Paul, in, in Ehrman's opinion, Paul believed that Jesus was a preexistent angel who became incarnate and then later was exalted to uh, a fuller divine status at his resurrection. So that's that's not a very common view at all. Uh, so you, you'll get those things, uh, but but you'll also get. Um, You'll also get uh, some some good and interesting historical backgrounds. Now, there's something <clears throat> you all refer to in there. You abbreviate the EHCC, which is the Early Highest Christology Club. Could you talk about that a little bit? Well, right, uh, and that that would be um, you know mostly the, the that's the section that Mike Bird did, but. Early High Christology Club is a, a somewhat tongue-in-cheek way of referring to a number of uh, scholars: uh, Martin Hengel, Richard Bauckham, uh Larry Hurtado, and uh, maybe others. Those uh, the scholars who who have done uh, done significant work on early Christology and the early historical, not not just uh, biblical evidence, but uh, surrounding the Bible and have concluded that um, contrary to the sort of uh, traditional critical approach that, that has said that Christology evolved slowly from, from low to high, uh, the early Christians taking a low view of Christ uh, as a mere man and then eventually 
going higher and higher to exalt him to divinity. Uh, the, this group of scholars uh, has concluded that no, from very, very early on, Christians regarded Jesus as divine in some way. And they, they, they may uh, tease that out a little bit differently. But uh, so that's the, the dubbing uh, of uh, early high Christology club uh, refers to those who've taken that, who've come to that conclusion that uh, Christians were worshiping Jesus and regarding him as divine from uh, an extremely early time. And we would all fit in, in, into that category defined that way, all the authors of this book. Now, <clears throat> there are two other authors, by the way, for those interested who couldn't join us today. And one is Simon Gavrikov. The other is Craig Evans, who we actually had on on March 1st, so that's fine. <clears throat> but, you know, in your situation, you're the one who wrote about pretty much the early church fathers afterwards and how they saw Jesus and the Star of Heresies. And you actually started on a rather odd note by saying that while Ehrman accuses the early church of excluding those who were unorthodox, you yourself experienced the opposite of being excluded because you were too orthodox. Yes, that's right. So I tell a little bit, a little story. I won't just go through it. Be, you know, let your uh, listeners <laughs> read it if they're interested. But but the the point was to uh, to observe that it's not just uh, conservative or orthodox Christians uh, who have uh, who are, who could be said to be exclusivists have an exclusivist strain in their in their theology and practice. Um, the story I tell is about being excluded from a um, from a liberal church, a mainline church, um, and you know, conservatives get the reputation of being exclusivists and non-accepting and so forth. But uh, most of the time, uh, liberals can be just as exclusive or more so than uh, conservative Christians, and that was just a story that illustrated that. But to of bring course we go ahead. Okay. But of well, course yeah. we do know that in the early church that <clears throat> there were constantly heresy hunters going around seeking who they may devour, as it were. <laughs> right? Yeah, that's what they would have you believe, isn't it? That's uh, well, I think I think Professor Ehrman uh, plays into this uh, uh, popular idea of early Christian theologians uh, in the Orthodox tradition, what we might call traditional Christianity, Orthodox Christianity, being um, uh, kind of on the hunt, on the lookout for uh, any, any slight deviation from standard teaching, you know, ready to uh, uh, strike at any point and, and knock everything down. So uh, this is, you know, one, one thing I point up at the beginning uh, you know, reading reading Professor Ehrman's book, others as well, but this one in particular, uh, there are often lessons that he seems to want to teach the reader. And one of those lessons uh, that you'll pick up is that Christians, at least Orthodox Christians, Christians who care for theology uh, and getting it right, uh, those Christians are not people to be imitated. They're not people you want to be like. They're uh, there, there's a strong, strong sort of ad hominem argument uh, that uh, uh, runs through a lot of, of what he says. And that's one of the things that to portray these people like Irenaeus or Hippolytus or Tertullian as, as heresy hunters in that way. But uh, it's, it's largely a distortion. Uh, certainly they were, these, these uh, theologians were uh, were concerned to protect their parishioners from heresy, but it's too easy to read back into their lives um, some notion that they were able to crush their opponents in some way. Uh, these early theologians had no political power. Uh, they could, they could uh, maybe, they had influence obviously in their own congregations, and uh, people who read their work uh, would be influenced, but they, they didn't have power to oppress or persecute. 
And it also, uh, that sort of portrayal of, of them as uh, kind of fire-breathing heresy hunters also ignores the, the fact that um, what we know about the, the heretics, so-called, uh, would show us that they were at least every bit as intolerant uh, most of the time as, as the heresy hunters. So it's a kind of a caricature, but it, it gives you an indication of uh, the sort of underlying tone of, uh, of a lot of Professor Ehrman's work. This, this kind of, um, I mean, you may, be, you may be going to this later on, but uh, stop me if, if you are. But it, it, this tendency culminates in his uh, uh, ultimate charge towards the end of his book, that uh, Christians persecuted Jews because of uh, because of Christians' understanding of Jesus as divine. So Jews could be portrayed then as as those who killed their own God and uh, could be charged with deicide, and therefore that would justify uh, any kind of any kind of uh, intolerant or oppressive actions towards Jews. Well, I do <clears throat> hope we can go there further eventually. It all depends on how things are going to work out with Dr. Keeling and Dr. Bird. But for now, we are going to take a quick break because i got more questions <clears throat> for Dr. Hero here. I'll be back after this break. I'm Nick Peters. This is the Deeper Waters podcast discussing how God became Jesus. Check out DYIWorldwide.com. DYIWorldwide.com. Home of Grok Radio. Free music downloads, advice, prayer, and support. DYIWorldwide.com. Do you Grok? And we're back. Right now, I've got Dr. Charles here with me. We're talking about how God became Jesus and largely about his chapters on the early church and Christianity. Now, we we're talking about <coughs> the heresy hunters. And I think part of Ehrman's strategy could be dealing with the whole cultural minds that we have today that the early church was seen as intolerant and that history as we know is written by the winners. And so there you can easily just paint a picture of orthodoxy as the winners. So they rewrote history and we're very intolerant. So they're definitely bad guys. Mm Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yes. Yeah, I think that, as we said, that's that's kind of a running theme throughout his a lot of his work, and certainly is the case uh, with uh, with this book as well. Uh, so the last uh, a couple of chapters in his book do take us beyond the New Testament, the New Testament world, into the early church, and and that that is one of the one of the themes. Uh, and another one of his his themes, you might say, is. Uh, uh, what he calls uh, uh, these these ironies, or what he calls a hard and fast irony, and that is that uh, widely held views among Christians, cert- certain views that were, that were once widely held or even considered orthodox, later became unorthodox or heretical, and so you in effect have Christianity turning on itself and declaring to be heretical uh, beliefs that Christians held earlier. Uh, I, I think that's, that's something that, uh, uh, well, c- certainly something do- Dr. Ehrman uh, wants to emphasize, and he does it uh, with uh, several examples. Uh, I argue in the response book that um, most of these examples are not very good examples, but certainly we have to recognize that uh, there is a development in Christian theology. Uh, there always has been, as uh, older ways of stating things are maybe found to be not perfect, and uh, improvements are made, and so forth. But uh, it's it's really not very often that you have something that is considered to be orthodox later uh, determined to be heretical, um, and in particular the. Uh, well, three of the main examples he cites uh, I go into and uh, uh, argue with. The, the, the first one, and it's kind of his Exhibit A, you might say, 
uh, for him the most important one is that, uh, in his view, the earliest the, the views of the earliest Christians about Jesus, what they believed about Jesus, uh, later came to be regarded as heresy. And what he says they believed was that Jesus was uh, adopted to be the Son of God, adopted to be divine, when he was, uh, in fact, uh, just a man. That was uh, uh, that's supposed to be the earliest Christian belief uh, based on the, the uh, belief that he had risen from the dead. So um, Erwin actually comes back further than a lot of scholars do, and, and in fact, back further than he used to do himself to say that Christian, Christianity did adopt a, a view of Jesus as divine from a very early time, from not long after the resurrection. Of course, Ehrman doesn't believe Jesus really did rise from the dead, but he acknowledges that some of his early followers believed he had risen from the dead. From that point, they, he says, they exalted him to divine status in some way. And uh, that, but that was, a, that was a, an exaltation to divine status on the part of, of God adopting him, adopting Jesus to be his son. That, he says again, was the first Christian belief, but later that became regarded as heretical. Uh, it's a view called adoptionism, that Jesus, a mere man, was, was adopted by God to be divine, and uh, Christians later condemned it. Well, that, that, uh, that irony, uh, I would say, is, uh, is false on both ends. That is, uh, you have a really hard time um, showing that that it was the earliest Christology, the earliest uh, faith of the earliest Christians. Uh, I don't believe you can show that, and we can go into that question. Uh, and then on the other end, the uh, the Christians or, or those who called themselves Christians in the second and third century, centuries who uh, had this view we call adoptionism, it doesn't look like Ehrman has has rightly uh, described those those views. Uh, there were people called Ebionites uh, who are said to have had this this view, and so the uh, the charge is that later Christians uh, chastised the Ebionites, the Ebionites who actually believed what the original Christians believed. But it turns out the Ebionites. It doesn't look like they ever believed Jesus was was divine in any sense. Uh, they believed he was a Messiah figure, a prophetic figure, a Jewish figure throughout, but he was uh, he was not divine. So that that's kind of Exhibit A in his uh, in his uh, museum of of uh, ironies of the Christian faith. Now. There are some Ebionites, though, who uh, some people who say the Ebionites trace themselves back to James. Well, what do you think about that? Well, I mean, it, it, you can't actually uh, you can't disprove that the second century Ebionites uh, might have done that, but uh, I think you can disprove or challenge strongly the idea that they had a legitimate reason for doing that. Uh, so, yeah, it's, the scholars might look at the, the, the epistle of James and not find a great deal of Christology there. That's, you know, that's, just, uh, uh, that's just the way it is. We don't find as much Christology uh, in James as we do in uh, 1 John or in the Gospel of John in the Gospels. Um, and so James is looked at as very Jewish. The Ebionites were a Jewish group that didn't believe Jesus was divine. And so uh, scholars will make that um, connection. But uh, I really don't think that there's a lot uh, that, that, you know, that, a lot that is uh, in any way trustworthy for that. Uh, there were Gnostic groups that also traced their lineage back to James and uh, you know, Gnostic groups who 
uh, or Docetic groups who couldn't believe that Jesus was human. So uh, they believed he was only some kind of divine figure. So uh, just because uh, there were claims or similarities in one sense, uh, it doesn't doesn't make a a uh, genealogy. Now you've uh, said that the, you don't think the uh, you can establish that Ermans view was the earliest view of the church, the earliest Christology. Why do you think well, that is? Why do you think the Orthodox view was the earliest view? Right. Well, that's a, that's a great question. It goes to the heart of the book, and heart, I mean the heart of the argument, uh, uh, both in Ehrman's book and really in ours. And I think that uh, Dr. Tilling would probably want to weigh in on this as uh, his chapters dealt with this a little more directly, but I'd be happy to uh, talk about that a little bit. Uh, sure. Ehrman, Ehrman as, a, as a historian, uh, wants to try to find the earliest earliest Christian traditions that he can. And, of course, those, those are actually found in our New Testament books. But, like, like most uh, scholars, he would say that uh, the earliest information about Jesus is not, not really the Gospels, or at least the earliest writings that we have are not the Gospels, but the letters of Paul. So you can go to the letters of Paul, it's thought, and get an earlier Christology than what we find in the in the Gospels, strangely enough. But uh, so, and lot, most scholars would, would agree with that in general. So you look at Paul, and uh, well, it turns out Paul does have a very exalted view of of Jesus, a very high Christology. He he believed Jesus was pre-existent. Uh, there's there's no question about that. Um, but there are things in Paul's letter that seem to predate Paul. Uh, scholars have long looked at a number of passages. Uh, one well-known one is uh, Philippians 2, uh, 6 through 11, uh, often thought to have been a, a pre-Pauline hymn or a semi-creedal kind of a statement. There are, there are places like this <clears throat> and, uh, and others uh, where Paul seems to be quoting or alluding to or paraphrasing earlier statements. Uh, so there you get an idea, possibly, of an, an even earlier Christology. That, so that's Urban's method, is to go and find the, these earliest bits of pre-Pauline tradition and build from there. Okay, that sounds, that sounds okay. Sounds pretty unobjectionable, probably, from a, a historian's point of view. But we have in these pre-Pauline uh, snippets in Paul, um, well, what you could characterize in different ways. Uh, Ehrman finds in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 3 through 5, where there's, there's a, a confession about uh, Jesus being um, uh, die, dying and being buried and then, and then rising and then appearing to uh, Cephas and then to others and finally to himself. Uh, there's in that in that confession there's no mention of Jesus being pre-existent, pre-existing as God or being divine. It's only a uh, confession about his uh, death and resurrection. And you have another place in Romans one at the very beginning, Romans one three, where it talks about. Paul talks about uh, Jesus has descended from David according to the flesh and declared Son of God or uh, shown Son of God by his resurrection. Well, there it seems that he's, he's, again, only said to be Son of God because of his resurrection, no pre-existence. Well, those are thought to be, then, the earliest, encapsulate the earliest Christology. But, wait a minute, you have to read a couple more chapters later in, in um, Herman's book, and you find out that there are some other pre-Pauline bits in Paul's letters, and they give what Herman calls a, an incarnation Christology, not just an exaltation Christology, where he's exalted to godhood. He starts out as God and becomes incarnate. Uh, for instance, uh, 1 Corinthians 8, 6 is one of those. And uh, the Philippians 2 passage that I mentioned is one of those, where 
uh, Philippians, God, uh, Jesus exists in the form of God and does not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself and became became one of us and became obedient even unto death on the cross. And therefore God is, has highly exalted him and, and given him the name above every name. You know, So there you have uh, Jesus already God and he becomes man. Well, in Ehrman's his historiography, there is a chronological grid to this. How do we know which of those which of those traditions is earliest? The exaltation Christology or the incarnation Christology? Well, Ehrman seems to take it for granted that it is the exaltation Christology that came first. That Jesus was only exalted to be God after his resurrection, and that the incarnation Christology must have come later. But he doesn't tell us how he can know that. He can only know that if he presupposes that. There's nothing that dates one of those pre-Pauline confessions earlier than the other. You could just as well argue that it's the incarnation Christology that is first. And in fact, I would argue that uh, they're probably co-equally old. That is, um, in any confession or creed, uh, even the ones that Christians use today, you never say everything that you believe. You, it's always only a summary of what you believe. And so when Paul wants to emphasize uh, that Jesus is descended from David according to the flesh, you know, in fulfillment of prophecy, he starts there with a confession. Um, when he wants to emphasize the, the truth of the resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15, that's what the whole chapter is about, the belief in the resurrection, he starts with that aspect of what Christians believe, that Jesus Christ died, he was buried, he was raised. He doesn't back up to the very beginning. He doesn't need to there. So I would argue that uh, all of these uh, sort of creedal statements that might be pre-Pauline, um, are already just abbreviations of a larger theology. And in fact, the one place, uh, they mentioned Philippians 2, uh, where we have that an incarnation theology, we have both, really. We have Jesus uh, in the form of God, did not consider uh, equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself, and therefore God highly exalted him so you have there a pre-Pauline statement that integrates both a what we might call an incarnation and an exaltation Christology. Uh, I think that's the way it was from the very beginning. It was uh, it was an integrated, excuse me, an integrated Christology in which Jesus is acknowledged to be both divine and human. You know, we find this throughout the New Testament. Uh, in, in John's Gospel and in John's letters, in the book of Hebrews, we find it all throughout the New Testament. Uh, different authors talk about it in different ways, but, but they all seem to agree that uh, Jesus is both divine and human, and that's as far back as we can go. Okay, well, right now we are trying to get uh, Dr. Chris Turing on the air. Now, he is mentioning to me. We're, we're trying to work out those technical difficulties, but for now, we're going to take a quick break. I'm Nick Peters of Deeper Waters Podcast. We'll be back after this break. Are you tired of the same old corporate Christian music on the radio? Check out Music Surge on Grok Radio, playing Christian music that doesn't suck. Download episodes now at cyiworldwide.com. And we're back, and my guest is Dr. Charles here, and we're trying right now to get Dr. Chris Turing here. He's by his phone. Where he needs to be is just making the connection right now. That's being really difficult. So we're trying here to do this. Now, so pretty much what you've been t saying is that there never really was this period in church history where there was this hand-wringing going on, saying, oh my gosh, Jesus, is he divine, is he not, is he deity, is he not? Right. It was pretty much the church was speaking with one voice, weren't they? Yes, and, and that's 
that's another thing that that Urban does in the final chapters when he's talking about uh, the early church. He he coins a term. Uh, he calls it uh, uh, ortho paradoxes. Ortho paradoxes. And the reason he calls them ortho paradoxes and not just paradoxes uh, is that, uh, in his view, these are paradoxes that the Orthodox had to come up with in order to uh, sort out these conflicting uh, ideas that were handed them by the New Testament authors. And uh, they knew they had to come up with them also to fend off heretics who might want to go in one direction or another. So uh, this this notion of pro, of uh, ortho uh, paradox, uh, Professor Ehrman paints it as a as a conundrum, uh, a big problem that the early church had, and this was a sort of a last resort. He talks about them, the orthodox settling for the paradox of the Trinity. Uh, well, of course, there are a lot of problems with that. One problem is that uh, it doesn't when you read the the church fathers, they don't seem to be settling uh, for anything that uh, is kind of a, a second choice or a disappointment, an embarrassment. Uh, they all seem, you might say, to glory in this uh, in this paradox, as we we would say that that uh, the author of John's Gospel did uh, when he says that the Word became flesh dwelt among us, and we have beheld his glory, and glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Uh, this was a glorious thing for them, that they they had to confess, and they, they confessed joyfully that this one was, was both divine and human, not in a way that they could necessarily fully comprehend, but both, uh, both facts are are, are uh, firmly and, and joyfully proclaimed in the New Testament. And not. Um, I, I find this also a big problem for, for Ehrman's uh, method, for his, for his view, is that uh, these, the notion of Jesus as God and the notion of Jesus as man were not disparate notions that the Orthodox had to uh, had to deal with from coming from various sources, uh, but we find them integrated in the very in the New Testament books themselves within the same author, and that's what I was uh, getting at before. But uh, we see it throughout the New Testament that the idea of Jesus as God and Jesus as man is is integrated in a book like uh, the Gospel of John or. Uh, First John or or Hebrews and those books like those in particular where there's there's actually a, a lot of reflection upon both sides uh, you might say of of Christology his uh, Christ's divinity and his humanity so again just rather than being uh, an embarrassment that uh, early Orthodox felt they were saddled with uh, they saw it as as one of the glories of of the faith that they proclaimed, and these so-called irreconcilable uh, ideas had been rec- they'd been reconciled to these ideas from the very beginning. And let's talk a little bit also about <clears throat> what you had said earlier about how Ehrman thinks that if we hadn't had gone down this route, Jews wouldn't have been charged with deicide, and I'm sure he would probably even say that we wouldn't have the anti-Semitism that we had in the early church, supposedly, or the later church even, going on. What do you think about that? Well, I, I have to say that was one of the most disappointing uh, parts of, of uh, Professor Ehrman's book. Uh, again, this, this part of his, his larger anti, uh, or his larger ad hominem argument against uh, Christians uh, that, that supposed to have been through Christianity, that uh, some Christians have done bad things. And the reason why he's able to talk about the uh, mistreatment of Jews um, in a book on Christology is, in his mind, because uh, the Jews were charged with 
having uh, killed their god, this idea of deicide, and therefore that would justify mistreatment of them. Well, you know, there are, there are several things wrong with that picture as well, I think. Um, the only person, uh, the only source that Ehrman comes up with where, that, that explicitly um, uh, nails the Jews, you might say, or, or criticizes the Jews for, for um, killing their god is, is a person named Melito of Sardis. He lived in the second century, and we have it in a sermon of his uh, in which uh, Melito is a very rhetorically gifted uh, preacher, and he plays on, on contrasts and ironies, and, uh, and uh, 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 one of the great ironies that he plays upon is, is the irony that uh, the, the Jews... Uh, the people of God turned against their own God. And uh, he does say that the, the Jews uh, essentially put God, put their creator to death. Uh, how ironic and, and uh, so forth. Well, uh, that's, that's true. The Melito does do that. But Melito, again, was living in the second century. Uh, he had no uh, political clout. Uh, he uh, didn't use this as a rallying cry to persecute Jews. Um, it wasn't until you know the fourth century that uh, Christians came into any kind of favored religion, uh, favored relationship with the state. And then uh, so Ehrman jumps to the fourth century and uh, finds places where Christians now in that favored position uh, could could take a, um, a different relationship to Judaism and felt that they had the upper hand. And there are, play, there are times when uh, uh, synagogues might be burned and uh, Jews might have uh, second-class citizenry in the, in the Christian em Christianized empire. And again, this is laid at the, at the feet of the idea that Jesus is God. Well, there again, you'd have to, you'd have to pause and say, um, is it really because Jesus thought that, that, that Christians thought Jesus was God that all this mistreatment uh, occurred? Uh, can't you just say that this is a this is a sad and tragic um, set of circumstances because human beings are human beings and even Christians are not uh, fully sanctified and uh, their temptations to power there as well in the church. Uh, in other words, I, I would argue that it, it didn't have uh, much to do at all with the idea of deicide. Um, so one of the things that I go to uh, in making that point is, uh, well, we, we can think of at least one religion that had a prophet that was not killed by anybody, by Jews or anybody, and that prophet never claimed to be divine and is not considered divine, but that doesn't, has not guaranteed that all the representatives of that religion have always treated Jews kindly. Uh, well, quite the opposite. And if we want to go down that kind of a that kind of a road, we could we we should uh, point out that uh, atheism uh, has also spawned its uh, uh, its share of oppressive regimes. Uh, there's just no comparison when you look at the uh, the mass murder, the mass slaughter uh, that communism has perpetrated uh, in uh, you know just the past uh, 100 150 years. So um, it, it's it's not a very good argument. As I said, I was I was disappointed that uh, Ehrman uh, put so much stress on this in a, in a book on uh, the early early views of of Jesus Christ. Okay, sorry about all the technical difficulties. We're still trying to get Dr. Turing on the air here. And <clears throat> so uh, what we've been uh, doing here is discussing the early church and their views of Jesus and such. And the, now, 
what about, what would you say to someone who's safe from the set? This all came up, say, at the Council of Nicaea, for instance. Yes. Uh, uh, what, was, what exactly is the question? I'm sorry, I missed part of that. Uh, well, some people might even go so far as to say that this was introduced at the Council of Nicaea, but from what I remember about Nicaea, mm-hmm. that it was, in fact, Aryan's views that were seen as the very distinct difference there, and this would, in fact, indicate that Arius' views were incredibly new, rather than something that the Church was really debating. Yeah, so you, you can talk a lot about uh, about Nicaea and Arianism. Um, I, I make the, the point in the book that uh, a number of the early uh, alternatives to Orthodox Christology and the and Orthodox view of the Trinity, a lot of the early alternatives uh, simply had no uh, long-term chance of success in Christianity, and, and that was because uh, basically they were they were so at odds with large portions of the New Testament, and it took the church maybe a while to sort all this out and to get this straight, but. Uh, a number of things like modalism, uh, the view that that uh, uh, there is only one God, but and this God manifests himself in three different modes, not three different persons or distinct persons, <clears throat> but three different modes. He's, at one time he's Father, at one time he's Son, and another time he's Spirit. This is an idea that, that uh, took hold in uh, around the, the beginning of the third century. Well, that view... Uh, you could see why it may have been attractive to some at a time, for a time, uh, particularly of people just coming out of paganism, but it had no real long-term uh, chance of success if the church was going to base its uh, its belief on, on the New Testament. Uh, the same thing with docetic views about that, that Jesus uh, was a, a heavenly being who only seemed to be human, who may be uh, possessed a human being for a temporary period of time or something like that. It's not really until we get to the Aryan controversy that we have a, an attempt uh, that, that, that sounded more biblical, that sounded like it, it, uh, it dealt with the New Testament evidence, and uh, it, didn't, it, didn't, it seemed to a number of people like it, it, it made sense. Um, it's not until we get there that we get, uh, you might say, a viable uh, alternative. And that is what occasioned uh, the calling of the Council of Nicaea, uh, the teaching of Arius, who, who taught that, that uh, Jesus is divine and he's human, but that there was a time when Jesus was not, the second person of the Trinity was not. Uh, so that puts that puts uh, Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, in this precarious position. Is he really God? Is he fully God or not? So the church did have uh, a number of deliberations, Nicaea being being the main important one there, um, but then other councils as well to try to sort that out. Um, and it was, uh, it was uh, decided that uh, Arius' position while sounding biblical in many ways, was not fully biblical. It didn't, it didn't uh, satisfy uh, the criteria laid out, you might say, by uh, John's Gospel and by Paul's uh, letter to the Colossians and uh, the book of Hebrews and so forth, and just uh, the honoring of, of Christ as fully God. So uh, the Arian controversy, which started in... in uh, uh, the fourth century, early fourth century, and was uh, decided on at the decided against at the Council of Nicaea, and uh, for many many years uh, the church still struggled with that. Uh, Arianism was a new thing, uh, even though it 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 claimed to be, uh, represent the tradition of the church. Now, when you were saying all that. I was thinking about how when you got to the point where you said there was a time the sun was not, that there are some listeners out there who are probably atheists and Muslim who could be saying, wait, wait, didn't Tertullian himself say there was a time when the sun was not? Yeah, I don't believe so. I, there's, 
as I said that, that uh, earlier, Christians before sure. the time of Nicaea, before Athanasius, probably did express themselves yeah. at times in inadequate ways and didn't tie up the loose ends, you might say. So there are some statements that Tertullian makes that uh, have left him open to that kind of uh, criticism or objection. But I think when you when you read um, uh, um, all Dr. of what Hero, he says, I think yes, Doctor Hero. Yes, I, I think we've got Doctor Turing here on the line. Doctor Turing, are you there? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Oh. This has been a this has been a trial finding a, a connection. Sorry to interrupt, guys. Yeah, yeah, and and sorry that it, it took so long. Uh, we'll uh, let uh, Doctor Hill finish his point right quick, and Absolutely. then we'll, yeah. we'll get one from there. Well, uh, just to, uh, very quickly, I think when you look at uh, all of Tertullian's statements, uh, it's it's very clear that. He uh, believes Jesus, uh, the second person of the Trinity, what, is not a created being. He's, uh, he's uh, co-essential with the Father. He is of the same essence. So he clearly states that, and he's, uh, he gets us very close to the uh, Nicene statement. So I'll leave it at that. Well, since we got Dr. Turing here, what I'm going to do then is, so you can get in the most time about interruption, I'm going to go ahead and take our third break. When we come back, and we'll have Dr. Turing here to discuss certain matters. And I'm Nick Peters, the Deeper Waters Podcast. We'll be back after this break. It's here, the official Rock Radio mobile app. Listen to your favorite rock radio shows on your Apple or Android power devices. Best of all, it's absolutely free. So get it now in the Google Play or iTunes App Store or grab a link at cyiworldwide.com. And we're back here and we've got Dr. Turing and Dr. Bird. I mean, Dr. here online. Dr. Bird should be joining us later on here. And But next week, if you're here, we're going to actually have Hugh Ross joining us. He's going to be talking about two of his books, Hidden Treasures and Book of Job, and Why the Universe is the Way It Is. And then we're going to be, in the second half, talking about Asperger's and Apologetics for Autism Awareness Month, you himself being an Aspie, just like yours truly here is. But now uh, we've got Dr. Hill and Dr. Turing. You know, uh, Dr. Turing, you uh, wrote a lot on PAR and Ehrman's usage of PAR. What, what do you think about how Ehrman used PAR overall? Um, well, first of all, um, is is Charles Hill still on the line? Yes. Oh well, yes. Um, just to just to say hi there. I, we haven't actually spoken before, <laughs> but there we no. are. Thank you for your comments on my chapter. Um, yeah, my Paul. Pleasure. Well, to be honest, um, uh, Bart Elman doesn't have too much to say on on Paul, which is part of my complaint in in the chapter. Uh, where I deal directly with this. He does a little bit of exegesis of Philippians chapter 2, uh, and particularly what's called the Philippians hymn or Philippians poem, whatever you want to call it, uh, verses 6 to 11. Um, and uh, what I try to do in, in my chapter is only very briefly touch on, on that, really. Uh, I, I think his exegesis is, is a little shaky, um, but the, the, the more problematic issue is that's the only... Uh, piece of exegetical work that he does in Paul's letters, um, and so I try to raise the eye, uh, uh, the reader's attention to um, uh, Christological material in Paul that absolutely must be taken account of, and which he he didn't address. Yeah, you've got a great line here. You say fourth, and I want this point to sink in. Ehrman's question of our exegesis of Philippians two six three eleven is the only extended engagement with Paul's letter in his entire book. Ehrman has constructed a case about the nature of Paul's Christology by analyzing in depth only six verses in one passage. Just one passage. Your coffee or tea should be in the <laughs> process of being spat out over this book in disbelief. <laughs> now, of yeah. course, that, that is a very important passage for Paul's Christological <laughs> understanding. But there are so many more passages he could have gone through. Why do you think he didn't interact with Paul more? Um, well, I don't. I don't think it's unique to to Bart Elman to focus 
uh, a little too exclusively on Philippians 2, 6 to 11. Um, you know, how it is in, in New Testament studies is often uh, scholars will specialize and atomize and in order to write uh, detailed exegesis on a passage about a given subject, they simply can't focus on, on, on everything in Paul's letters. And so what's happened is scholars over the years have tended to focus on what have, you know, the classically important texts of Christology, 1 Corinthians 8, 6, and Philippians 2, 6 to 11 being, being the key. So he's not alone in doing this, um, but that's not to justify his move. Um, it's, uh, I think there's, uh, there's Christology in Philippians chapter 1 and Philippians chapter 3 that's equally, if not more important than the Philippians hymn. As, I mean, as I've argued in my, my book, Paul's Divine Christology, but elsewhere uh, as well. And as, as for why doesn't he engage with Paul more is a good question, because Paul's letters... Uh, it's, the, it's the earliest set of Christian documents that we have. You know, these documents go back to the 50s AD, and maybe even earlier. And I have a friend who's, who's just going to publish a book called Framing Paul, and he argues uh, pretty cogently that First uh, Thessalonians may even go back into early 40s. Uh, so we're dealing with very early texts here. And I, um, I, I think it's, uh, it's a... It's a lacuna. It's, it's a mistake in his work not to engage more thoroughly with Paul's Christology. If he had done, I think um, uh, there would have been considerable problems uh, for his wider thesis, especially this move from exaltation Christology to incarnational Christology. I mean, that is simply refuted in Paul. I think earlier in the book that uh, Michael Bird had said that when he sees... Herman say something about historical Jesus. He wants to tweet epic face palm to him because Herman always says that we don't know what the original text said. Now, what that has to do with you, uh, Dr. Taring, is I put this in the notes here on my on my copy of the book on page 103. You talk about how Herman says that we can find in the text traditions that are oral traditions, and I agree with that, of course. That go to before the time the New Testament was written. Of course, obvious went to 1 Corinthians 15. And Ehrman then in his book tries to go back to what these oral traditions were. And I put this here. It says, we can't know the original text, according to Ehrman, but we can know what the oral tradition is behind the text. It just struck me as a bizarre situation for Ehrman there. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think um, as, as well when he comes to engage, whether it's oral tradition or whether it's pre-Christian sources, which is something he tries to do. And again, he's not alone in doing this. Uh, classically, Romans chapter 1, uh, there's a, some material in chapter 1 that many consider to be uh, pre-Pauline. In other words, it's, it looks as though Paul is using uh, tradition that's, that's older than, than him. Um, but the problem is, he's very selective in the way he uses or, or he tries to work with pre-Pauline tradition. Uh, and that's what I highlight in my chapter. Well, I'd like to point out now that it looks like we've got another caller coming in here. And I think, Dr. Bird, are you here also now? Yep, I'm right here, mate. Good to see you, Nick. And good to hear from you. So all three of you are together now. Now, when we put Dr. Turing on, he realized that's the first time he'd got to talk with Dr. Hero. So is this the first time for you also, any Dr. Bird? Uh, for me talking to who? Any one of these two. Uh, no, I've had their, the, the pleasure of their acquaintance a great many times. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's, it's good to Too see Too many that. times, Mike. Yeah. Too many times, particularly particularly now that Australia is once again in the ascendancy of the cricket. <laughs> yeah, all right. Yeah, move on, move on. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we might as well move on because I have no idea what you're talking about there. I, <laughs> I, I, I don't pay attention to sports any when the Super Bowl comes on over here. I read a book during the game and put it down during the commercials. <laughs> That's the kind of guy you're dealing with. Okay, well, I'll, I'll give you a hint, Nick. Cricket is not an insect. I'll leave it there. Yeah, I, I, I know that much. I, I know Ravi Zacharias has talked about playing cricket when he grew up, and I think he pretty much said it's like playing t-ball, except you get, or playing baseball or some sort, except you get served tea. 
damage. Okay. <laughs> to me, it sounds like a great sport if you get served tea. But anyway, now, you are free, you're free to jump in here because I'm going to be trying to ask questions to each of you as much as I can here. I've already spent some time with Dr. Hero, so he said to give deference to you two. But he did say that, Dr. Bird, when you come on, you need to tell us about how this book came about. I mean, it wasn't that... Both publishers got together and said, hey, let's do this little juxtaposition. You publish one book here, I'll publish one book here, and let's see how they go. What, what is the real story here? Uh, well, let me clarify. Uh, there was definitely no conspiracy theory. Um, Harper One and Zondervan did not get together and, and uh, concoct an idea to corner both sides of the uh, Christology market and to come up with one book uh, against Jesus as divine and another book uh, in favor of it. Uh, basically, at the last Society of Biblical Literature, which was held in Baltimore, uh, I was walking up and down the bookstores, and I saw these huge, massive advertisements for Bart Ehrman's forthcoming book, How Jesus Became God. And I, I saw this, and immediately I realized that in the coming months, I'm going to be getting emails from people who have heard of or have read or who have been talking to people who have read Ehrman's book, and I'm going to have to get very busy telling these people that whatever Bart is saying probably ain't the way it is. So for the sake of clearing my email box, uh, <laughs> I, I knew it, it would be a good idea if I did some, uh, what I would call some pre preemptive pastoral apologetics. And I had from uh, Ehrman's other works, I had a pretty good idea where he was going to go with this so uh i thought well you know it'd be good to come up with a response even if it's something like a short ebook or something and uh, i cruised around the exhibit halls and i uh, i came across some of my good friends including chris tilling craig evans and simon gathercole and i said um what do you guys think about doing a short response to airman and uh lucky for me uh simon and chris were both uh very open to that that idea I then went up to one of my uh, editors, to my uh, publisher, Zondervan, and I told them the idea I was thinking of. They told me I was crazy and I was stupid. And I said, but I've got Chris Tilling and Simon Gathercole already willing to do it. And then they realized that my craziness might in fact be a form of genius. And um, it, was at, it was at that point uh, that we, uh, we, we then got to work on the book. We got to work on the book. We were graciously allowed to see a copy of Barney Ehrman's book in advance. So we were able to see the manuscript and we, we read over that around the Christmas New Year period. And uh, that was a cracking good read on Christmas Day, let me tell you that. Um, and so yeah, we worked over the manuscript and we all, we all had all different areas we we're going to respond to based on our expertise. Uh, Chris is obviously a you know a bit of a, a guru swami ninja on Paul's Christology. Um, Simon Gathercole has done some excellent work on the Christology in the Synoptic Gospels and worked in the non-canonical Gospels as well. I've done a bit of historical Jesus stuff, and so yeah, we found our our our, our uh, areas we're going to work on. Then we got to work, put the manuscript together, went through a, a lightning fast editorial period, and uh, as we would say, Bob's your uncle. Here we are. Now, I did try and contact Harper one way. I did contact them and see if I could get a copy for the show so I could have a better discussion. Unfortunately, that didn't come about. So I've got your all's book here, and that's working, working good enough. Now, I like to, I've already heard this from Dr. Hill, but why do you all think that this book is so important? Well, let me put, put this way. Um, Bart Ehrman has a huge influence. Mm -hmm. And like I said I frequently get emails from people who have come across someone who's read one of his books and is convinced that the whole Christian thing is just a big mistake. Right. And, uh, and in fact, I would say I, I've received a number of emails from, from Christians in the Middle East who have been... Um, discussing, debating with Muslims Christianity, and these, these Muslims in the Middle East are pointing to the works of Bart Ehrman as reasons why Christians in the Middle East should give up their faith and become Muslim. 
So for me, that's one of the reasons why I think uh, a, a book like this is important, because for uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, Unitarians, Muslims, they're going to think all their Christmases have come at once. Now, I know there's, a, there's an irony in that, um, because Ammon is putting together a very a popular and interesting proposal uh, that Jesus is not, in fact, God. He's just a human being. And I think if, if, if people are going to get the history right, know what the New Testament says, know about the archaeology as well. I think it's crucial that they know that, that Bard is not holding all the aces, that there is an alternative way of understanding uh, the origins of devotion to Jesus as a divine Lord. So for those reasons alone, I think the book is, is, is worth reading by a lot of people. Dr. Keering, do you have anything to add to that? Um, no, not really. I think um, Mike has nailed, the, nailed it there. I, I think, uh, as well, when I'm when I'm reading a book uh, uh, like Bart's, uh, it's it's also a matter of academic rigor, of being academically vigorous, and uh, I think we need to call him out on on a few issues relating to that. Um, nothing else, though, beyond that to add to to Mike's comments. <coughs> No, I'd uh, just asked Dr. Turing about this, and it relates to thing, something, Dr. Burr, that you and him both talked about, and so maybe we can have some good back and forth on this one here. But earlier in the book, Dr. Bird, you said, I have to confess that whenever I read Bart Ehrman saying anything about the historical Jesus, I always feel like tweeting, at Bart Ehrman, epic face palm. And the reason for that is that he keeps saying we can't know what the text said, but it's unreliable, it's untrustworthy, but I'm going to use that text anyway and tell you about Jesus. Now, when we get to uh, page 103, Ehrman talks about how he's going to try and figure out what Christians believed in 30 to 50 AD, or as he has it, CE. And that's by going to the oral traditions that are behind the text. Now, of course, I'm not disputing those traditions exist. Of course they do. But I read this and I just put it in my notes here immediately. We can't know the original text, but we can know the oral tradition. And I, I just found that fascinating. Yeah, I, I find it um, fascinating in the sense that there's, there's a glorious incoherence in, in uh, Ehrman's argument. Um, so... You know, he says in his other books, like Misquoting Jesus, where he emphasizes at length the instability in the textual tradition of our New Testament manuscripts. And let me say, Ehrman is a first-class textual critic. Uh, he mm -hmm. has done right. some very good work, and he has my highest respect. I'm not questioning his work as a text critic. I think in his popular-level books, he has overemphasized some of the evidence for the fluidity and instability of our textual manuscripts and other people have answered him on those grounds uh, ranging from uh, Dan Wallace and others um, but but this is this is the problem I have with Ehrman um, you know he, he will he will take his happy agnostic bus on a tour around America saying things like we can't talk about the Word of God because we don't even know what the actual words were and then in the next book, he will then use the New Testament as the basis for reconstructing the historical Jesus, the Apostle Paul, Mary Magdalene, and Peter. And in my mind, you, you, you just can't do that. Um, you, you can't write one book and say the emperor has no clothes, and then in the next book say, I love what the emperor was wearing at the Vanity Fair Oscars party. So part of me would like to know which of, which of Barth's own books does he believe? Because the stuff he says in his book, Misquoting Jesus, would rule out any chance of him saying anything about historical figures or the oral tradition behind the New Testament. You know, both, both of these things simply cannot be true. Now, sometimes when Bard is in more scholarly formans, uh, forums, he'll be more guarded, less, um, how can I put it, uh, less... Um, populist and less extravagant about his acclaims and he'll, he'll, be, he'll be a little bit more upbeat about our ability to reconstruct uh, the original or at least an initial text of the New Testament. So there's a, there's a bit of a, 
a bit of a duality going on here. Sometimes Bart makes these extravagant and outrageous claims about the corruption of the New Testament, but in other forums he's a little bit more upbeat about it. And I think that's a little bit of duplicity, which you know I, I, I'm not particularly fond of. But if you take his main claims that you know the Bible is corrupt or the New Testament is corrupted, um, it's fluid, unstable, and yet he's still able not only to use it but go behind it. I think methodologically that leaves some great big questions to be answered and some huge inconsistencies in what he's saying about the early church and his ability to study them. Now, since you did mention Dan Warris and textual criticism, I mean, we obviously can't spend the whole show talking about that. I will tell people if you want to find out more about that, Dan Warris will be on the Deeper Waters podcast here on April 19th, so tune in then. I'm sure we'll be talking about Ehrman Private Fair. Now, since you talk about his methodology, uh, Dr. Tilling, um, one thing I've noticed about Ehrman's methodology is that he seems to be extremely literalist and rather fundamentalist in his handling of Scripture. And you can tell it made an impact on him because you can hardly read a book by him where he doesn't mention his Mark II deconversion story where mm. he pretty much had his Damascus Road experience. Mm. Now, when you've seen how he's interpreting the text here, I mean, the only extended work he does in par is Philippians 2, but of course he, tr- he touches other texts. Do you notice the same kind of thing that he has a rather literalistic reading of the New Testament? Um. I can't say I've seen the same in Paul, to be honest. Um, I think uh, I, I, I would call his reading um, unsophisticated rather than literalistic uh, when it comes to Paul. He's not too self-critical, it seems to me, at least in this book, when it comes to um, the interpretive categories that he is using to, with such decisive effect uh, to interpret whole swathes of New Testament uh, material. He's not really reflecting very deeply on those categories, and and of course that's what I spend a chapter um, having a go at. Uh, Dr. Bird, what do you what do you think about that in the material that you handled as well? Do you think that a uh, Ehrman usually does take a more literalistic approach that would rather be foreign to the text? Uh, in some cases, I think he does. Um, I, I wouldn't say it's an overarching characteristic of him. Um, you know, Ehrman does have a, a, a fundamentalist Christian background, um, you know, in places like, you know, Moody Bible Institute and, and, and other places. Uh, and, and that's probably left a little bit of an imprint on, on the way he handles the text. Um, but with Chris, I'd say sometimes that the problem is, is maybe not a, a, a strict or wooden literalism. Um, sometimes it's, yeah, it's more of an unsophistication. Or, or, or sometimes he's, it looks like he's trying to push certain texts into a, a certain interpretation that looks like it might fit, uh, but on closer examination doesn't really add up uh, if you look at it in depth. Well, I've got another question to ask, but we're going to take a quick break right now. I'm Nick Peters of Deeper Waters Podcast. We've got Dr. Charles here, Dr. Chris Tiering, and Dr. Michael Bird. Quite a group here all together talking about their book, How God Became Jesus. We'll be back after this break. Hey, this is Minister Grok. Thanks for listening. Although Grok Radio is free, there are costs to upkeep the website, podcast, and purchase Bibles and materials for street ministry. And while we are happy to pay this ourselves out of pocket, we will gladly accept any gifts if you feel led to support the shows and our street ministry. You can send a gift or love offering through our website at cyiworldwide.com. Thanks for your support, and God bless. And we're back, and I do want to remind all of you out there listening that, yes, everything we do here is listener support at Rock Talk Radio, and specifically everything I do at Deeper Waters is supported by you. Please consider going to deeperwaters.wordpress.com, my own blog there, and making a donation to support the work that you, go, that you see going on here, rather in this case, here going on here. I'm doing the best I can to get you the best in scholarship. We've got three brilliant minds right here doing great work for the kingdom, and I want to keep it up with bringing it to you. And if you click there, you'll find out how you can make a donation to what I'm doing, and it's done through Ratio Christi, and that will be, by the way, tax deductible. So... 
<laughs> whatever you got to lose. You make a great investment in the kingdom, and you get a nice little tax deduction for it. Now, for all three of you, one claim that uh, has to be understood is what it's actually meant by saying that Jesus is divine. Ermin means something by it, and when we say how God became Jesus, we mean something. I mean, when we say Jesus is God, I recognize that's theological shorthand, but we still mean something. So what are we talking about when we talk about the divinity of Jesus, and what do you think Ehrman's talking about when he does the same? Uh, I was going to say, if Chuck's there, it'd be good to get an exposition from him about what he thinks the mature uh, or final um, definition of Jesus' divinity is uh, by the standards of Christian orthodoxy. Hmm. Well, <clears throat> certainly by the time we get to the definitions of Nicaea and beyond, uh, Christians are talking about deity as uncreated and in practical terms uh, we worship God we don't worship things that are not God um, so you know we, we could talk about more technical terminology but uh, uncreated and, and the whole terminology as used for the Son uh, that is uh, begotten, begotten but not created. Theologians spent a lot of time discussing that distinction, and uh, that's a distinction that uh, you know has, has a long prehistory before Nicaea. Uh, Tertullian used it. Um, uh, Justin Martyr used it, and uh, going back all the way to uh, to the Gospel John. So. Uh, that that is a, a very an important distinction that uh, God is uh, uncreated, self-existent, um, and uh, unlimited. Uh, uh, so yeah, we can go on a number of uh, a number of uh, theological terms, but uh, I think just to stay with something as very basic as that, it's. Well, maybe those two things, because I think they both relate to some of the earlier discussion that uh, Bart does, and then that uh, that Mike does as well in the first chapters of our book. Okay, uh, Dr. Burr, Dr. Tune, do you have anything you want to add to that? I think uh, Chris puts it very well in terms of summarizing what we would call Nicene Christology. And that is the view that Jesus is fully God. Uh, he's begotten, not made. He's not a created being. I think that that's, that's a good summary of it. And it's not just something that appears in 325. It does have antecedents in guys like uh, uh, Tertullian, uh, Irenaeus, Justin, and others. There's a bit of diversity along the way as they get there, for sure. Mm. But the, the big question is, and this is where I think uh, Airman is right to, to push us on, is how far does that Nicene or Nicene-esque Christology go back into the New Testament? Uh, now, that is, that is a genuine question because I, I think it would be wrong to say that, you know, 10 seconds after Pentecost, that God basically downloaded the Nicene Creed into the mind of all the apostles and all the Christians it did take some working out, some figuring out, as Christians had to think through their faith, my goodness, what has just happened? We've just seen a man we thought was a prophet, the Messiah, crucified, rise from the dead. He seems to speak not simply uh, from God, but for God from the inside. And now he's exalted to God's right hand. And I think it did take them a while to come up with the right grammar, the right categories, find out which scriptures best explicate his person. And so what we need to think, though, is whether the move from the New Testament to, to Nicaea, there is some degree of development going on. The question is whether it is a logical development or whether it is more akin to a type of evolution. Um, now, I, I'd be interested to hear from Chris Killing as where does he think Paul stands in relation to a Nicene Christology. Uh, is, is Paul providing the ingredients 
for what would later become a Nicene Christology? Or is it more the case that uh, the Nicene Christology, the Nicene view of Jesus, is a fundamental misinterpretation of Paul and, say, John? I'd be here to hear, to hear from Chris on that one. Yeah, yeah, but that's a, that's a key question, isn't it, Mike? And uh, mm. uh, where I would uh, I would position Paul on this, and I'm trying and pains in in the chapter to try to make a very brief case for this, is that what we have in Paul is something that is very logically translated into slightly different terms, where where, where words are. Uh, uh, um, uh, relating to ontology directly are, are developed, uh, but what we have in Paul um, is 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 some, a very Jewish way of, of expressing what we would understand as as Nicene uh, orthodoxy, uh, and that's that's absolutely crucial. You see, because I'm unpersuaded that that Bar Elman has has done the work of a historian in in his work here. Uh, he hasn't really defined his terms. And, uh, and in particular, the, the question at the beginning was, what does it mean to speak of Christ as divine? And, and what Bart Elman has done in, in the book is, is use this as a very nebulous concept into which you can sling pretty much anything from, from God occasionally right through to angels and demons. Because he's well aware that the New Testament says some very exalted things about Jesus, you know, some incredible things about Jesus Christ. So how do we account for that? He's asking himself. Well, Jesus is divine, but not God Almighty. That's his key claim. It, just that Christ is divine, but not God Almighty. Of course, God Almighty is divine as well, but, but, the, but the, this is precisely the kind of terminology, terminology he deploys in order to create a distinction between God the Father and, and the Son, or the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, at what would in Nicene terms would be an ontological level. I think all of this runs roughshod over, over the New Testament text. If we're going to do the work of a historian, then we need to really think back in uh, to their, uh, their mindset and, uh, and really wrestle with, with some complicated issues relating to ontology, relating to epistemology. That is, how do we, how do we know things and, and when we put all of the pieces together as I argue in my chapter what we have is a very Jewish way of including Jesus on the divine side of the line monotheism must draw between God and creatures in other words what we have is, is uh, uh, a Jewish way of, of uh, speaking of Christ as homoousios with the father yeah, I think it's really important Dr. Tim, that you want to emphasize the Jewish way and how Paul would see it because I was going to go straight to you as well with this, since Paul is really our earliest, as far as we know, as far as understanding of the way Jesus was viewed. And one passage in the Old Testament that Paul did interact with, and Ehrman never does in his book, is the Shema. The, for our yeah. listeners, the hero Israel, the Lord our God is one. Now, how important would that be to understanding divinity in the Jewish Sense, and how does Paul use that text? Yeah, great, great question. Uh, you know, the Shema was the closest thing that Second Temple Judaism had to a creed. Uh, uh, there's a good chance that uh, the Jews were praying the Shema twice daily. You know, this was very much in the horizon of their imagination, and it uh, and it was a text uh, which spoke of. Well, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength. And, and then it went on. There was quite a, a few other texts added to it. And it's very interesting how Paul then deploys the Shema um, in his letters. And it, I did find it quite amazing that, that Bar Elman didn't mention the Shema, even though he spends quite a lot of time speaking about Jewish monotheism. I, I say a little bit cheekily, in, in the chapter, but it's a little bit like speaking of, of the Second World War with, w w forgetting to mention Winston Churchill. Uh, I, I think it was just, it was poor uh, scholarship. But what does Paul do with the Shema? It, well, this is a fascinating issue. The Shema, the, the, the identity of the transcendent uniqueness of God, uh, involved a loving commitment to the one God of Israel. Uh, and that's exactly how the Shema runs in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 6. Uh, it's it's the, the confession of the oneness of God is coupled with a confession uh, relating to our love 
uh, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And, and what Paul does in, in 1 Corinthians 8 through to 10 is, is speak about the relationship between uh, Christians and the risen Lord uh, using Shema language. And, and Paul bends this to speak of Christ. So what do we do? What do we have here? We have uh, a Jew wrestling uh, with the concepts available to him in order to speak about Christ as sharing the transcendent uniqueness of God. And, and this is just simply Paul's language for doing this. We, we've all got this, whether it, be, uh, whether it be Tertullian, whether it be Athanasius, whether it be Paul, they were all wrestling with the impact of Jesus with the language and categories that they had. And they were all using that language to come to pretty much the same place. Okay. Now, when we do talk about how God was viewed as divine here, we have to also realize that there was a kind of view that God was separate entirely from everything else. The creator-creation distinction that was made, which is stressed a lot in Barkham, who you all mentioned, Ehrman does not interact with at all in the book, which is something very concerning. Now, Dr. Bird, you did a lot on this. How was it that God was seen as divine in the sense that nothing else was seen as divine? Well, this is about the categories that you're using in terms of what is unique to God and what separates him from creation. Uh, Basically, and that is the main point, that God is the creator, not the created, and we only worship the creator, not created things. And this explains things like prohibition of the worship of angels because angels themselves are created and subservient beings and that's why you don't worship them now where there was worship of angels and that there are there are types of literature where you can find a type of veneration from angels even there it was not the same type of veneration that was given to Yahweh given to Israel's Lord There could be prayers made to angels in in some literature and things like magical amulets and that sort of thing, prayers for protection. But you never find the same devotion given to angels as is ordinary given to uh, Yahweh, given to Israel's God. And that is fundamentally because uh, there is a distinction between God and the created world. Um, So that's that's how I I was just trying to, based on what Chris has been saying, uh, there, I think, is the, the basic definition of monotheism, that there is one God who made the world and all that is in it, and you worship him rather than anything else. So, Dr. Turing, I'm sure then that you'd agree with Dr. Bird and probably Richard Barkham at the same time who'd say that by putting Christ in the Shema, as it were, in First Corinthians 8, Paul is essentially Christianizing the Shema and including Jesus in that divine identity. Yeah, I you know Richard Borkham is the most brilliant scholar I know in working in this area. Um, it was a great pity that um, Bart Elman didn't uh, show any engagement with him. Um, yeah, I I like a lot what uh, Richard Borkham does. I I prefer to back away from the language of identity myself, um, but uh, I, not to make a substantially different point. And I would only say in, in 1 Corinthians 8.6, which is, which is the verse uh, Richard Borkham and others spend much time on, where Paul seems to Christianize the Shema, 1 Corinthians 8.6 is a part of a much longer argument, uh, 1 Corinthians 8-10, through to 10, which speaks of Paul's response to uh, uh, the eating of food offered to idols. And so it's the whole section which speaks of uh, divine Christology in the fullest sense, not just um, 8.6. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, Dr. Here, in response to all that, would you say that the church throughout its early history did keep up that distinction going on, that it recognized that, that God was uniquely divine, yet somehow included Jesus and the Holy Spirit in this as well, or would they just worship many other lesser divinities? <coughs> many uh, lesser divinities? <coughs> Excuse me. 
Uh, no, I don't think there is uh, good evidence of that. It is, uh, as as uh, Chris and Mike are saying, it's uh, uh, it's certainly the case that throughout the New Testament and, and on beyond into the early church, all the way through, we see devotion to Jesus as devotion to Yahweh. And mm-hmm. this, this comes out mm-hmm. in so many ways. I think uh, Chris did an excellent job in uh, one of his chapters in, in uh, explicating that, uh, in how we see in Paul, for instance, it's not just the words he might use about, about Jesus and, and uh, in the same way he might use these words about, about uh, Yahweh, uh, God Almighty, God the Father, but, but it's in the, in, the, in the devotion to, it's, it's, the, it's the prayer, it's, it's, uh, it's, mm-hmm. it's worship of, it's, it's the entire uh, fabric surrounding uh, his, his language and his, uh, uh, his, his life, uh, his mm-hmm. patterns of thinking, Mm-hmm. that we see this the same sort of reference, the same sort of uh, attitude and devotion towards Jesus as we as we do to God the Father. And uh, you know this is this is certainly a, a very consistent all the way through into the early church. Um, you know we, we I'm sure if, if uh, Simon were here, we'd be talking a little bit more even about the the gospels and about Jesus own, um, usage and uh, I, th- I think of of uh, simply where, where he he poses the question of you know, who is who is the Christ whose son is he and uh, where he he says well if he's David's son uh, how is it that he, that David calls him Lord um, saying that uh, the other Lord said to my Lord sit at my right oh. hand this was a very important text that, uh, that, that, that Jesus himself alluded to. It, uh, very important. That was picked up on in the early church as well. And uh, one thing that I, that I went into a little bit in one of my chapters was how it is, it is this understanding of the Old Testament itself and the various... It's finding that the persons of God, the persons of the Godhead in the Old Testament that introduces even into the, the language, the, the evolving technical language of the church, these, the, the concept of, of person with regard to uh, the, the distinctions in the Trinity. Uh, Christian exegetes would ask, well, who are the persons speaking in, in the, the Psalm, Psalm 110? You know, uh, the Lord says to my Lord, uh, who is speaking when 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 we have each of these uh, statements being made? And they were talking about the, the person of the Father and the person of the Son or the person of the Holy Spirit. Uh, this this did give the basis for uh, the, the technical language, the Trinitarian language of of uh, three persons uh, within the Godhead, but being of the same essence. So it it is it really is a a very natural and organic development that we see you know, going all the way back to Jesus and his his provocative questions uh, that that he put in his lifetime through Paul and the rest of the New Testament writers and uh, uh, through Justin and Irenaeus and and on and on up until uh, the fourth century definitions. Well, with that, we're going to need to take a quick break. I'm Nick Peters with Deeper Waters Podcast. Our guests are Dr. Charles Hero, Dr. Michael Bird, and Dr. Chris Turing. We'll be back after this break. Oh yeah. Hey folks, it's Will ZPI, and you guys gotta check out CYIWorldwide.com, home of the Grok Show, free MP3s, music, advice, and even prayer support. That again is CYIWorldwide.com. Check it out. And we're back to the Deeper Waters podcast. <clears throat> we're in our final segment here. Now, Dr. Hira just talked about Psalm 110.1, which I think is, in fact, the most quoted verse 
of the Old Testament that's found in the New Testament and how that shaped Jesus' understanding of himself. And so let's get Dr. Bird on this question. Uh, how did uh, how do you think Jesus saw himself and his relation to God? And it wasn't the case, you think, for instance, that he was walking around and just seeing him back and saying, hey, I'm God, over and over. How, how did he see himself? Uh well, I, th- I think first of all, you're, you're right, Nick. You know, Jesus did not cruise around Galilee and Judea saying, "Hi, I'm God, second person of the Trinity. I'm going to die on the cross soon for your sins." But before that, let me tell you some good sun- some good stories you can use in Sunday school in the future. Um, and and anyway, one credit to Ammon. Uh, he's Ammon at least enables us to explode that kind of um, naive way of thinking about what Jesus was saying about himself. Uh, so for whatever Ehrman's failings, uh, if you read him, you'll definitely won't come across with, with that idea that Jesus is walking around so heavenly minded, you know, reminiscing of the times where he was playing the harp with the angels up in heaven, that type of thing. Uh, what, what Jesus claims is that he is sent from God and that he has come to put into effect the kingdom of God that God has promised the Israelites a kingdom that is also going to come to Judea, but it's going to expand and include the entire world. And his central claim is that he is the king of that kingdom. And, and as, as we read more about what he says as well, we, we see some claims that go along with that. Jesus seems to speak and act uh, with a divine authority, an unmediated authority. He doesn't simply say, thus, you know, or, or the word of the Lord came to me. He speaks as one who, who, who has an interior point of view in the mind of God. He speaks from God on the inside. So he, he makes some very unique claims. He also seems to identify himself with, with God's own activity in the world. And there's a number of sayings we could go into on this one. And very astonishing as well, he claims that he is going to be enthroned with God. Uh, not on a, on a throne next to God, not his own miniature throne, but he, he says he's going to share the very throne of God. And, and that is a great claim to a divine regency, which means he is going to rule and be worshipped as one who is God. So I think there are, in, in to various degrees, both explicit and implicit, divine claims made by Jesus in the Gospels. Dr. Turing, do you think that would be back further, that Paul would have shared that same understanding of Jesus' claims when we look at passages like Romans 1, 3-4 and Philippians 2, 5-11 or passages about Jesus even judging the world and such? Um, I'll be honest with you, I, I, I faced a little bit there. I've already had a couple of glasses of wine. I'm at a wedding reception. Uh, so could you just uh, say the question again? Right. <laughs> how Jesus <laughs> saw himself as occupying God's throne alongside him, not just sitting on a throne, but uniquely as the agent of God through whom God would rule his kingdom. And so I was tying in that throne aspect to Romans 1 and Philippians 2. Um, yeah, uh, that... Yeah, Paul Paul does have quite a bit to to say about um, the enthronement of Jesus, and and Timo Escola has has written uh, probably the best um, monograph on on this issue when it comes to to Paul. Um, it's it's clearly going on there in Paul. There's, Paul is doing some work with. Uh, Christ sitting at the right hand of the Father and so on and, and, uh, and Christ is clearly uh, an exalted agent in Paul um, but that's not to say the same thing that Bart Elman says with that he would agree uh, with what I've just said uh, but um, uh, we do need to take uh, what, is, what the dominant language and the, the dominant pattern of, of Christologically relevant data in Paul much more seriously than, than Bar Elman does. And, and then things start to come into sharp focus. And what we have uh, is, is an exalted agent uh, who is uniquely exalted in the sense that he shares God's transcendent uniqueness. 
you know, my humor aside as thinking to me that we should all be impressed that you're able to wax so eloquently on Christology and Paul and <laughs> Jean Bartram and after having a couple of glasses of wine. <laughs> this is what yeah. biblical scholars yeah. do, after all. Well, think of me. I just woke up 40 minutes ago. And seven <laughs> I'm sitting here with my pajamas and a cup of tea, wondering oh, yeah, why, a picture wondering why Chilling is drinking wine at 7 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, I got up at a 5.30 in the morning one time to do a debate on Unbelievable, so I feel your pain there. <laughs> mm. It sounds yeah. like a good thing we're not all on Skype. So. <laughs> yes. A lot of us are. Uh, uh, Dr. Bird, one aspect of this that you brought out that I thought was pretty interesting is we can easily think of a passage such as Jesus answering Caiaphas in Matthew 26 about the phone, but one that you brought out was the the account of the rich young ruler and how uh, Bart Ehrman does say this is a passage where Jesus seems to treat the son of man as someone else but if that's the case if the apostles are going to be sitting on 12 thrones what's Jesus going to be doing? Yeah, I mean one of the arguments that um, Ehrman puts forth is that Jesus thought of the son of man the coming son of man as a figure other than himself um, now, th this was a view that had some traction um, a number of decades ago. But to be perfectly honest, I think it kind of died around the same time that Disco did. <laughs> uh, so, um, one second, I've got, I've got children waking up wanting to get ready for school, uh, for church. Um, um, yeah, so Ammon puts forward that, and then sometimes you can see where he gets it from. You can see in, in certain sayings, you can see it's possible to read that way. But when you view the Son of Man sayings globally, it becomes virtually impossible uh, for two reasons. Number one, uh, in a lot of places, um, the Son of Man is clearly a form of self-reference to Jesus. And, I mean, we could, we could go into the Aramaic background of the Son of Man sayings and what, what Son of Man or Ba'inasha means in Aramaic. We could go into that, and that would be a further indication of um, the self-referential nature of a lot of, of, a lot of sayings. Um, in fact, when I was reading Bart Ehrman's book, I, I was reading it wondering what Morris Casey would say to this. Uh, Morris Casey is uh, a somewhat, again, a, a non-believing biblical scholar, and he would share a view that Jesus' um, divine nature evolved, but he has a very different idea about the Son of Man sayings. Uh, and what they mean, and he would be completely against Ammon. So on, on the one hand, the Son of Man sayings are clearly uh, self-referential, but in other cases, if you adopt Ammon's view, you get some really odd things going on. For example, when, when Jesus says to the 12 disciples, uh, something along the lines of, you know, and you will sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel, uh, and, 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 that, and then the Son of Man will be on his throne as well. So if the Son of Man gets a throne, if the 12 disciples get a throne, well, where is Jesus? Uh, but particularly if he is, as Ammon says, the, the Messiah of God's kingdom, well, what, what does he get? Does he get, get to sit outside on the bench or something? Um, you, so you've just really got some real odd things going on. And I think um, Ammon's take on the Son of Man sayings and a Son of Man Christology is probably one of the weaker elements of his book. Mm. Well, we've only got about 11 and a half minutes left in the show here, and normally I <coughs> do things a bit later, but since we've got three guests here, I'm going to have to divide the time out between all of you here. Now, I'd like everyone to know, the book is available on Amazon right here. It's How God Became Jesus, The Real Origins of Belief in Jesus' Divine Nature, A Response to Bart Ehrman. The other authors are Craig Evans and Simon Gavrico, but we've got Dr. Charles here, Dr. Michael Bird, and Dr. Chris Tilling here already, and, and somehow, Dr. Tilling, you got left out here on the mention on Amazon. You're going to have to do something about that. And, uh, oh. Yeah. Well, there, there may have been a reason for that. Hmm. Uh, I'm sure there was. <laughs> we just don't know it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, of it's course, global conspiracy against me, I know it. Mm, it. It's because of pseudo scholarship, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. Yes, there, there, it's an inside joke based on a, a new review that's popped up here. But it's for sale on Kinder on nine seventy eight for nine seventy eight and on paperback for twelve fifty six. Now, I'd like to just wrap things up by having each of you just 
give some final messages and such. So, Dr. Bird, let's start with you here. First off, if someone's really keen on what they've heard from you so far and such, and they want to know more, how can someone get in touch if you find out more? Uh, well, you can follow me at Twitter on uh, at MikeBird12. I also have a blog, which I, uh, I do with my friend Joel Willits called Evangelion. Uh, or if you, you know, troll around through Amazon, you could probably find a few other books by me as well. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were to leave the audience here with what would be like your final main message to them concerning this book or anything else, what would it be? Uh, well, my message would be is that, you know, Bart Ammon is a very good communicator and he raises some very, very good questions which we have to seriously engage. I'm not going to dismiss him as a crank because he's not. He's mm. a very learned chap. Right. He's a very capable scholar and a very good communicator. So you, you just can't ignore him and <coughs> him and hope that he'll go away. Right. Um, so we need to take him seriously, and he does make some good points here and there. Mm -hmm. But uh, he's not holding all the aces. And there is a better way of doing history, um, less open to some of these uh, you know, inconsistencies and in methodology, and there is a more coherent account of the story of how the early church came to see that in Jesus they had met God face to face. And I don't know if you uh, remember that song by Joan Osborne, What If God Was One Of Us. It's somewhat a, of a melancholic and mocking song. Yeah, uh, we, we used to watch Joan of Arcadia over here. That was the theme. Ah, yeah, yeah. So um, the good news is that, that God was one of us and God is for us. And that we see in, in, in the cross, in Jesus Christ, God is reconciling the world to himself. Mm. Uh, that's the message I would want people to take away. And if we could go to Romans 8 with that, we say, if God can be for us, who can be against us? Amen. Uh, Dr. Turing, do you have a presence on the web? So if people want to find out more, they can go and get some more information about you. Uh, yeah, sure. I, I've got a Twitter account, uh, but you know I tend to post pictures of cats on there most of the time. I've uh, <laughs> I've got a blog, uh, Christendom, uh, uh, without, without the T. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, uh, but um, uh, you know I've, the the place where I've I've developed some of my own ideas about Paul's Christology. Uh, it's a book called Paul's Divine Christology. Now, for any of your listeners who are strapped and loaded with cash, uh, feel free to go ahead and buy a copy. Uh, but my apologies um, that when you look at the price tag, you probably won't be too impressed. Mm. Um, I think as well, you know, with this, with the whole issue of Christology is, is. Uh, as, as Mark so brilliantly put there, you know, Bart Elman is someone we, we can actually learn from. Uh, and somebody, somebody Christians should indeed read and, and wrestle with. Uh, but more fundamentally, I think what these two books ask us to do is to continue to wrestle with the question of who Jesus is. Mm. And even putting it like that, who is Jesus rather than who was Jesus, points out the fact that we're dealing with something quite unique here. And, and I hope that that's an encouragement that people can take away with them. And I can certainly uh, vouch uh, in, in my, my own life to wrestle with the question of Jesus is to be confronted with God's unconditional love. And that is good news indeed. And, uh, and that's why I think it's worthwhile um, probing these questions uh, as best as we can. I'm not sure what you mean by the price you broke. I just looked and it's a steal at $112 and 10 dollars <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, buy away, buy away. Uh, I, I have to be very glad. Yeah, and with what you were saying about who Jesus is, I'm thinking about uh, my ministry partner just released something on the blood moons thing. And whenever I'm involved in debates with eschatology, I always keep saying the same thing over and over. It seems like more Christians are concerned with trying to figure out who the Antichrist is than trying to figure out who Christ is. And if only we could get that reversed. Mm, yeah, well, I met a guy in an elevator in uh, Boston who was convinced that the Antichrist was Hillary Clinton. So um, I think that's pretty much done and dusted, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I think it is, Mike. I think we're all agreed on that one, yeah. <laughs> now, um, Dr. Here, uh, Go ahead. Never. Go ahead. Uh, Dr. Hira, you haven't yet 
since last week, have you caught up to the modern age and given yourself a web presence, have you? Uh, yeah, it's um, it's at michaelbird.com. Uh, no, I, I, I don't, actually. Uh, I try to be as inaccessible as possible, but I'm, I'm there for anyone who wants to uh, drive to the deepest, darkest uh, sections of Florida uh, and uh, knock on my door, but beware of the dogs. Um, I can't help but think the deepest, darkest sections of Florida would be pretty bright compared to the rest of the world. <laughs> well, that's right. We're having an overcast day today, but uh, yeah, it's pretty nice. So, um, um, no, there's. Uh, I guess I'm on the RTS uh, Reformed Theological Seminary website. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and that's for when in Orlando for. Are interested right. there's quite a number of RTSs out there. What's the final message you would like to leave with my audience today? Well, uh, I would concur with my with my uh, cohorts here in terms of in terms of uh, Bart Ehrman and his contributions. Uh, they said earlier on. I think when all the dust settles uh, with with everything, all the problems that he has raised and all the uh, the questions that he's thrown, I think in the end it will actually be seen to have uh, helped the church because mm-hmm. it has brought out of the word woodwork uh, a number of people to respond to <clears throat> some of the things that he said that really probably have not been dealt with at least on a on a, in an accessible way uh, mm-hmm. very often. So. I, 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 I do look for this to happen uh, with this Christology book as well. <clears throat> uh, no doubt uh, many will be disturbed, but I'm, I'm very happy to say that, uh, that our book is, is there uh, to help minister to them. Um, <clears throat> one thing I think always to, w- one thing to keep in mind about this particular book is that uh, despite the way uh, Dr. Ehrman presents his material, Really, we, what we have a lot of is is uh, presuppositions uh, rather than conclusions. That is simply in terms of his overall uh, Christological framework, his, his historiographical framework of moving from low to high. Uh, so we've talked about that before, but I think to keep that in mind, ask yourself: Is he? Is he? Is this the? Uh, result of dispassionate research, or is it something that's a presupposition? And finally, uh, just what what Chris said: uh, the, the ultimate question that we all have to grapple with is is who is Jesus? And uh, you know, it's a question we know that uh, that our Lord put uh, himself uh, when he was put by himself to others when he was here. Uh, that is, uh, uh, who do people say that I am? And that's the, the question that we perennially need to ask and, and uh, uh, be thankful that we have uh, the sure answers in the New Testament. Well, I'd like to thank everyone for coming on. It took, it, we had some difficulties sometime in there, and any technical difficulties, I take full responsibility for or my in here, but I'm glad we got all of you together. It's been a fascinating conversation, and I'd like to thank Zondervan and Emily Varner for helping put this together as well. And people, please go out and buy the book. And I agree with Dr. Here. This is a great opportunity for us if we take advantage of it. Unfortunately, the church seems to drop the bar at times like this. Let's make sure we don't do that this time. You know, with uh, regards to everything that's going on here, we are let a Dr. Tieran get back to enjoying wine at his wedding, to letting Dr. Burr get back to getting his kids ready for church since it's Sunday morning over there, and Dr. I mean, Do- Dr. Burr will be doing that, and we'll get Dr. Hill going back to suffering for Jesus in Florida over there. <laughs> Next Saturday, we're going to have Hugh Ross again on the show talking about two of his books, Hidden Treasures in the Book of Job, and why the universe is the way it is, and then especially talking about Asperger's for Autism Awareness Month. It's going to be a great show. You won't want to miss it. I'd like to thank all my guests for coming on here. Thank you for taking the time to be on the Deeper Waters podcast. Take care. Okay. Thank you, Nick. And thank you, Nick. Have a good day, Mike. We'll see you all next week. For now, I'm Nick Peters, signing off.